This is the Wings Wild Edible Workshop on May 17th. It was supposed to be held at RCA Community Park, which is where our virtual hike will be hosted today. But instead, we are meeting virtually. And I do want to thank you all again for participating in today's workshop. I never want to miss out on the opportunity to teach about plants we can all eat. Again, my name is Rebecca Jania. I work for the City of Bloomington. But WINGS is just not supported by the City of Bloomington. It's actually a great collaboration and partnership between organizations throughout Indiana, including Indiana DNR, Monroe County Parks and Recreation, Fish and Wildlife. These are all women who enjoy spending time outside and teaching other women skills to empower us and to just, again, make us reconnect with nature on a deeper, more intimate level. All right, in today's workshop, a little bit of a breakdown of what I hope you will all learn today. So yes, you will all learn how to confidently identify some of these common edibles. I'm also gonna talk about ethical and safe harvesting techniques. It's very important when we're out there wild foraging and just really this is one of those activities that you almost have to step off trail. So it's important to remember these ethical and safe harvesting practices to keep you and as well as the wildlife safe. Uh, you're going to learn how to avoid some poisonous plants as well as harmful plants like poison ivy. We're going to talk about poison ivy. Can't skip over that. Um, a few tips on how to prepare wild meals. I have included links to some recipes as well as other uh, wild edible resources like books and workshops that are available locally. And hopefully so much more. There are plants in there that I can't help but discuss or point out. Um, on the virtual hike that might not be edible, um, or at least not in its entirety, but it's still so common that I know you probably are all curious of what they're called, so I can't help myself. Um, wild edible plants in Indiana, they live in woodlands, pastures, disturbed areas, pretty much all throughout the state. Um, during today's workshop, we're gonna specifically concentrate on wild edibles that are found in woodlands so forested habitats, as well as disturbed areas. And disturbed areas for me and for you could basically mean backyards or residential areas, places that have been developed over time and potentially that top layer of, of soil has been taken off and all we're left is with a lot of clay. Um, we will also be concentrating most of our time today talking about plants um, specifically. Now, there's a whole bunch of awesome wild edible mushrooms that are common in Indiana, but I could spend a whole workshop just talking about mushrooms alone. So for the sake of time and for today's workshop, we are going to concentrate our efforts on plants only with an honorable mention or two. It is morel season, chanterelles are coming up for instance. Um, but that's just another something to look forward to of a future wings workshop is mushrooms because I really hope to do that in the future. Um, again, before diving into the salad bowl that surrounds us, it's a good idea to be aware of some basic guidelines to ensure that we are following uh, safe and sustainable foraging practices. So without further ado, the long winded, lots of words, PowerPoint slide, I'm hopeful that most of these slides will be more pictures than words, but this is one that I can't skip over. And it's because wild foraging does have its dangers and its risks. So first and foremost, if you cannot clearly identify a plant, please do not ever just start ingesting. That is not the first step for identifying a wild edible, is tasting it. So poisonous plants and animals and funguses sometimes resemble edible ones. Those darn look-alikes can really even confuse me when you're out in the field. So checking and double checking also multiple resources. For instance, the internet is great, apps are great, but books are wonderful. Not only do I have field guides, plentiful field guides, I use Newcomb's field guide because of the wonderful dichotomous chart in the beginning. If you've never used a dichotomous chart, it's basically a one or the other choice thing. So as simple as you start off, does it have broad leaves or evergreen needles? And the more you go down the chart, the more specific it becomes until you are able to identify the actual species. This goes to the bottom of the page. Another part of the disclaimer is, I am not affiliated with Newcomb, nor am I affiliated with any of the other authors that I might mention or bring up their books today. I am merely recommending things that I have found from years of foraging myself. Um, 
I have different field guides because some are better for photos and ID tips, while others are better for preparation guides. So, and there's also the internet, let's be real. You can Google just about anything, but you wanna always double check your sources and make sure they are reliable. You can always feel free to reach out to me. I love answering wild edible questions. In fact, it's one of my favorite thing that I get emailed or texts about is, what's this plant? Can I eat it? So it's always good to have a friend on that side. All right, just a little bit more breakdown. Um, people like to ask this as a, as a parks employee. You are allowed to harvest fungus, um, fruit, leaves, foliage, flowers, things like that from most public property but you always wanna check bylaws first and you wanna make sure you have the permission of the landowner, especially if it's private property. And sometimes, especially in natural areas, that private property line can happen pretty suddenly and it's not always marked. So definitely plan ahead, check to where you're foraging. Don't wanna be having you guys break any laws um, when you're out there just trying to do a fun, frugal activity. Um, Again, I can't stress this enough, learn the few dangerous species in your area before venturing into the wild to forage. Um, there are common ones in Bloomington, for instance, poison hemlock, that all it takes is a little bit of small doses um, to be very toxic. So knowing those, those common ones to avoid um, is helpful. Using all of your senses, so don't limit yourself to ID alone. I'm going to mention ID tips like smell it, uh, feel it. It's not just about your eyes. There are different identifying characteristics of these plants that are helpful when you're trying to safely identify something for um, to eat. Um, learn the habitat. Just as important as physical ID is where are you foraging? Where are you looking? Some plants only grow in shaded, damp, woodland areas. Others only grow in full sun, dry, prairie-like settings. So knowing the habitat of the plant you're trying to forage for is just as important as knowing what it looks like. Um, companion plants, similar, a uh, helpful tip. We're gonna talk about uh, stinging nettles today as a popular wild edible. And I cannot talk about stinging nettles without talking about jewelweed, which is a popular and awesome companion plant that grows near stinging nettles that helps take away that itching burning sensation. So while it's not edible, it's very medicinal and one of my favorite plants. Um, and last thing on this slide is just uh, learn how to follow the wild edible plants through all seasons. And that helps with ID, you know, the most popular example I could think of is maple trees. Down the line, I would love to have a maple syrup program and for newbie enthusiasts, the easiest way to identify a maple tree is not in the winter when you're actually tapping it, but in the spring and summer when it's in full leaf. And you can easily identify those, again, maple leaf characteristics so you can come back later in the season and safely forage from it. So knowing how plants look in different seasons can be helpful. Again, I'm gonna point out today um, some of those, okay, this is what it looks like in seed, this is what it looks like in fruit, because those all help us um, safely and confidently identify that plant, as well as what are the plant parts that are edible. Continuing on, which is some things before we even get into foraging, is the leave no trace principles. I hope for many of you this isn't a new uh, turn of phrase by any means, but it is still important for me to stress. So leave no trace principles is the simple idea that, you know, what you pack in, you pack out. Uh, leave only footprints, take only photos, things of that nature. But with foraging, we are taking more than photos. We are potentially leaving more than footprints. So it's our, roles as land stewards, as people who respect and depend on nature to continue to care for it and use it in a sustainable way that ensures that we and future generations can benefit from it as well. Again, know your local environment. I mentioned this so already, but it's about abundance too. So what's endangered? If it's a rare plant that is not commonly found, the last thing you wanna do is be foraging it. So uh, ginseng very rare, very valuable plant that does not 
grow commonly around southern Indiana. I have found it. I have never once ever foraged it because I know the value and how endangered it is to this area. Be prepared. Have a plan where you're going, how long you're going to be. Be sure to tell someone before you're leaving. That goes back to a lot of safety. Um, I always encourage everyone, anytime I go somewhere out in nature, I do like to hike alone. I tell somebody. I let somebody know when they should expect me back. Um, but I also, it's for, for myself. I'm planning. How long am I going to be gone? Do I need to pack a snack? If there's not going to be trail nibble, nibble, might there be inclement weather? You want to wear the appropriate clothing and bring those required tools, which is part of a leave no trace principle that is still valuable to keep in mind when wild foraging. We're gonna go into details about clothing and tools in a little bit, but um, be conservative. Probably one of the most important things about foraging and being sustainable is again, never take more than you need. The rule of thumb is usually 20% of the plant, especially if you don't need to harvest the entire plant. If you do need to harvest the entire plant, for instance, let's say sassafras saplings, so small trees, and you need the whole bark and root and all of that. Well, there's usually a population of sapling trees in that area. So what you would do is only harvest 20% of that population, ensuring that it can repropagate and come back next year. Uh, tread lightly. You're going to be going off trail when we forage. Uh, on the nature hike today, virtual hike, I stayed on the trail, but I'm gonna warn you now that I never forage from trail edges because that's where dogs like to hang out and that's where people like to hang out. And so I usually treat the edges of trails as dirty. And so I would encourage you to do that as well. So you will be stepping off trail when you wild forage. And it's just really important to take small, slow steps. So you're aware of where you're stepping. You're not about to step on, again, a rare endangered plant or let's say a box turtle. They're out, they're active right now. There's not just, you know, at-risk plants, but at-risk animals that need us to be aware of where we are too. Um, not to mention the dangers of poison ivy, prickly things, so just watching your step, going slow, using deer paths is a really helpful way for foraging. That's how I tend to mark my route, is just using what wildlife has already created for me. And last but not least, uh, respect wildlife and people. You want to be considerate of our, uh, other park users, and especially at this time, we want to honor physical distancing. I like to go out and forage by myself, so it's really easy for me to respect that. Um, but I also like to keep my foraging groups small because it keeps treading lightly a lot easier. Um, going out in large groups makes that a lot more difficult. So again, if we were holding this workshop in person, unfortunately, I would not be taking any of you off trail more or less because a group of 15 or 20 off trail can do some serious damage or impact on the plant life. So just be conscious of, of who you're taking out, where you're going, if other people are out using the park, um, just be respectful of that. Oh, and one little note here before I forget, consider cultivating wild edibles in your own garden on your property. Most of these are native or they are weeds. Those are the ones I like to tell you to eat. But cultivating native wild edibles on your property is a very sustainable way to continue to make sure that these plants are available to you year after year. And because they're already naturalized to this area, they take a lot less water, a lot less babying as far as like adding manure and nutrients and things like that. So, you know, wild ginger, for instance, a fantastic substitute to euonymus and invasive English ivy. So essential foraging tools and supplies. I want to make sure everybody is prepared before we even go on a virtual hike. So these are some of the basics. This is what I usually uh, bring out with me when I'm actually going out there to forage and bring back a haul. So gardening gloves, so important, so simple. You're going to be managing and, and handling a lot of plants, some of which don't want to be managed or handled. So they're going to give you a skin reaction. Uh, sting nettle again. That's going to, it's known to give you the stinging, burning sensation. So you need to wear gloves. And it's also not just the plant that you're foraging yourself that I want to warn you about, but it's also surrounding plants. So this would be a good time to bring up poison ivy, you know, one of the most hated nemesis of wild foragers out there because it likes to hide sometimes even underneath the leaves of the plants you are foraging. So 
it might not you might not notice until it's already too late so gardening gloves as well as long sleeves are in my mind essential foraging tools so keep that in mind when you're going out there to start pulling or cutting or doing any of that that gloves are an important tool um, on that note pruning shears pruning shears are a good tool scissors were great but when you're going to start foraging for some of the more <clears throat> dense woody type plants having those pruning shears make sure that you're not <clears throat> yanking the plant out again pulling out the entire root system so coming back to the sustainable foraging this ensures that you're only cutting and removing the sections that you plan to use and um, you're not damaging the plant any further. So pruning shears, really, really great. Um, weeding knives. Not many people have ever heard or seen a weeding knife. So other than just saying a small shovel, I wanted to specifically point out what a weeding knife is because it's so versatile. It can be used as a shovel, but as you see, it's also got a sharp edge, blade-like edge. So when you're foraging roots and hard to cut roots, it lets you cut the root and dig out at the same time. So it's good for scoring, it's good for root harvesting, things like that. And it also, most of them are sold, I kind of cut it out of the photo, but with a little sheath that is easily attached to most belts or belt loops. So again, something you can easily carry around with you when you're out there hiking for a long time. Um, all right, and last thing, of course, something to carry your wild foraged, uh, your wild edibles. So breathable bags, baskets, buckets. I personally like to use breathable bags. So again, picture reusable grocery bags. They're lightweight. They allow for air to get in. So you're not getting this trapped in moisture. So you don't really want to use plastic grocery bags or Ziploc bags of that nature because it can start the decomposition process prematurely and you don't want that. So breathable light bags. Um, the other reason I, I personally like bags over baskets and buckets is because they're less bulky when I'm hiking around. But if I'm out there foraging, let's say dandelion flowers or violet flowers, and I want to be aware of crushing or damaging the petals or the leaves, I might want something that can hold its structure, so like a basket or a bucket, as opposed to a bag that I def I can much easily more crush um, and bang up against something. So just a little bit of that planning ahead again, what are you foraging for today? But you're, not, you're gonna run out of space in your hands really quick. So you're gonna want a container to be able to carry all that stuff. Um, I've already mentioned this once, but in addition to these four items I've, I've mentioned, it's important to have good resources to be able to refer to. So having field guides, having an app, an idea. I use iNaturalist personally, but there are so many out there. So just having that resource to be able to refer back to, whether in the field or when you get back to the house, I do tend to encourage people to bring have something that they can refer to in the field, just so you're not foraging something, harvesting it, taking it back to your house only for you to find out, oh, I can't use it. And now you unnecessarily harvest it. So just something to think about. I do usually wear long pants and clothes toe shoes. That's not just for plants that might make me itchy, but it's also for insects because I attract mosquitoes from miles around. And it is about to be peak, you know, mosquito season. So the more defense systems you can put on yourself, the more protection, like clothing, light materials though, it is gonna be hot soon, the better. So wild edibles in Indiana, there are so many to choose from. So a little bit of a breakdown. We have nut bearing trees, like our oaks and our hickories. We have wild berries and fruits, like raspberry bushes, the Indiana banana, also known as pawpaw trees. We have roots and vines. We're gonna talk about grapevines and green briars. So many edible leaves, some of which are pictured in this photo here. Of course, mushrooms, which I mentioned too, chanterelles and morels, and as well as tree sap. So I didn't wanna negate that. Our maple trees are very much sap producers. So I make maple, maple syrup at least the last two years. It is a process, but it is very fun. So if you're looking for a winter activity this February, maybe try making your own maple syrup. All right, some plants to avoid. 
Visco, I have to say it again. I know I already said it once, but it merits mentioning again. Know what plants are safe to eat and what points are not and which ones are poisonous. So if you don't know for sure, definitely don't eat it. Here's a little bit, um, a list of some rules of thumb. If the plant has this, you want to avoid. So the milky or discolored sap. So if you know milkweeds, really common, popular native plant, you don't want to ingest those. Spine, uh, spines, fine hairs, thorns, um, parsnip, you know, I go down the list. You guys can read the slide, but I do want to say that some of the wild native plants, or oh, I'm sorry, some of the wild edible plants, they're not all native, that we'll be discussing today share some of these characteristics. So again, that's why it's just important of knowing confidently, okay, this plant might have some fine hairs, but it also has X, Y, and Z, so I know it's to be metal and I know it's safe to ingest if I prepare it properly. <clears throat> um, I also put up there um, a photo of a dog urinating, and that's just because as silly as it is, it is really important to understand that that is also a way to easily make a plant ingestible. So you want to avoid those toxic areas. So trailheads are, are popular marking spots, trail um, um, property edges where forest and, and open fields meet up. You also want to avoid areas downstream from factories, along roadsides, busy roadsides, train tracks. You know, again, just being conscious of the environment you're in, the potential pollution that could be introduced. So, you know, emissions or dirty water, plants uptake water. So you wanna be aware of that. Um, some lawns are treated with pesticides and fertilizers. I can tell you that Bloomington Parks and Rec's properties, public properties are not treated with pesticides or fertilizers, but unless you know for sure, you know, golf courses would never never a wild forage for any lawn edibles at a golf course because I know for sure that that stuff has been treated by something that could be toxic to me. So you just wanna be aware of the areas you are foraging. Some plants are safe to ingest in certain ways. Let's bring back morel mushrooms, for instance. Morels are perfectly safe to ingest when cooked. However, when raw, they're toxic. They can make you sick. So, there's a reason why we talk about safe preparation tips as well as ID tips when doing wild edibles, because not all of them are safe to just do a raw trail nibble. And last but not least on this slide is not all plants are healthy. So if you see a plant that's looking like it's withered or curling back or discolored or sick in any way, probably a safe bet you shouldn't be eating it. I know it sounds silly to bring it up, but you'd be surprised. So just again, use some common sense. If the plant looks sick, probably shouldn't be eating it. Same goes with mushrooms. Now we're going to go into the actual plants and the plant ID. So during today's presentation, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna concentrate on wooded areas and disturbed areas mostly. So the first 10 species we're gonna discuss today are going to be woodland plants. So plants are gonna commonly find in forested areas around Indiana. Then we're going to transition into the plants that you're gonna commonly find in disturbed areas like backyards or public parks and mostly full sun areas. All right, wood sorrel. I love wood sorrel and it's one of my favorites to teach newbie foragers because of how common it is, how easy it is to identify, and how tasty it is to eat raw. So wood sorrel, another nickname, is known as sourweed because it's got a very pungent sour taste. Lots of sour tasting plants. I have to mention the oxalate acid that is in the plants. And so people with kidney or liver issues with gout need to be aware of ingesting plants with the oxalate acid because it could have adverse effects. So this kind of goes back, good time to mention it, that just because a plant is safe for me to ingest does not mean that it is safe for you to ingest. We are all different. We all have different allergies. We all have different um, um, uh, medical conditions. So it's important to know your own 
uh, limitations. And that is why it's also important to always try things first in small doses. Never would I encourage someone to just start going out there and chomping on a bunch of wood sorrel. First timers, you would take one of those little petals and sample. Wait a few minutes. Do you feel anything? Anything happening? You feel okay? Maybe adjust some more. But everything in moderation. And definitely don't be risking your own well being and safety just to try something because your friend's doing it, right? So, all right, back to wood sorrel. Some of the ident identifying features for wood sorrel are the compound leaves. They are heart shaped, and let's be real, they look a lot like common clover. So you can find wood sorrel, wood sorrel growing probably in your front lawn right now or around your yard, as well as really commonly around the edges of woodlots. Another way you can distinguish this between other clovers are the flower. So as you can see in the photo here, there's a small yellow five petal flower on wood sorrel as opposed to the fluffy flower cap that you're used to in red clover and white clover. So you can look for that yellow flower. It does like to close up overnight. So if you're wild foraging too early in the morning, that yellow flower could still be closed up tight on you. The seed pods, which I wish I had included a better photo of it, but if you can see on the top photo, the little seed pods attached to it, if you get your hand lens out, it actually looks like tiny okra pods. And those are completely edible as well. Um, I personally, when I use wood sorrel, if I want to use it as a garnish, anything you would normally use lemon for is a good substitute for wood sorrel. So like seafood, um, in fact, this is commonly used in different sushi dishes. You can use it just to spice up a salad, or if you wanted just to have, again, the yellow flowers as a pretty garnish, you could do that as well. Wild ginger. So wild ginger, very, very commonly found around woodlands in Indiana. It's an understory plant that has heart-shaped leaves as pictured in the top photo. Wild ginger, what we would be foraging for is the root. So for those of you, I mentioned sushi earlier, who like sushi and have the ginger on the side, it is from a root, the ginger. You can also make it into teas, drinks. It can be used as a garnish. Ginger is just wonderful and it is good for you. However, it can be toxic if you over ingest it. So it's all about doses, right? You'd need to basically eat four and a half pounds, I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure, four and a half pounds of wild ginger a day for three to six months to achieve the toxic dose given to rats. So in reality, even with a really, really big patch, I'm confident to say that you're not going to over forage and over consume wild ginger, but everything in doses, so you wanna sample it, try it out first, see if you have any adverse effect, things like that. Uh, you definitely want to avoid eating the uh, raw root um, if you can help it. So I, I, especially wildly foraged ginger, I boil it. I make it into teas a lot more. The other identifying features, the obvious one is that it is heart-shaped, grows on the ground in shaded, damp areas. There is a very unknown flower to it. Not many people realize that it flowers or have seen the flower. It's pictured in the bottom right corner. It's not, it doesn't actually have any true petals. Supposedly has a horrible pungent smell like rotting flesh and the reason it has that is because it's pollinated by flies and like dung beetles. So a little evolutionary characteristic for the wild ginger for you. Don't recommend going down trying to smell that flower. And the reason why wild ginger is good for wild foragers is the way that it's able to spread and propagate. It's a good plant because you will be able to only forage 20% and know next year when you come back, it's still going to be there. The reason for this is wild ginger propagates or, or spreads by rhizomes. So rhizomes can be considered a fancy word for roots. So as long as you leave the roots, part of the roots behind, the plant will be able to grow back or repropagate from that. So just going back to those sustainable foraging tips, never over, over harvest wild ginger so you can make sure you can come back next year and enjoy it. 
ramps. Can't have a um, wild edible class without discussing ramps. <clears throat> they are commonly found throughout woodlands all throughout Indiana, but not common enough anymore. And that is honestly because of how popular wild foraging has become and for how easily prepared and enjoyed ramps are. So I do have a little message at the bottom that if you are going to go out and wild forage ramps, I tend to say one leaf will do it and only take the leaf. So you wanna leave those roots behind. So again, it can repropagate for next year. But the identifying features for ramps is the way you're going to see them out in the field is those long elliptical sphere shaped leaves as pictured in the top left corner. They emerge early spring, so we are, the window is closing for ramps sooner than later, but they're still out there. They have a very distinguishable red stalk to them and a smell. So ramps have an oniony smell to them. And that's why they're so sought after because they can be eaten raw, they can be sauteed, roasted, grilled, pickled, made into pesto, so many things. That is why we have to be conscious of them. <clears throat> they do go to flower. Some people don't catch it in flower, but they usually uh, emerge six weeks after the leaves. The flowers are whitish cream color and they have six petals if you get really close with your hand lens. But it's usually when they start to get the little uh, berry pods at the ends where people can be like, all right, that looks very interesting. It's not uh, snake root or another misidentified, or I'm sorry, a different species that they might misidentify. So looking for those leaves, the long elliptical sphere-shaped leaves, low growing on the ground, they will grow in patches, is how you will commonly find them. Can grow ramps on your own. They like the wet and shady areas and there's information and resources available from Lucas Lane Farms in Smithville, so local, and they can teach you and send you ramp starts for you to grow in your own yard or backyard. Stinging nettles. Stinging nettles, while intimidating for newbie foragers, are so delicious and packed with nutrients and vitamins. So they are worth a mention and they are worth tr the trouble I'll show you. I'm going to point out jewelweed during our hike, but I don't want to bombard you yet, but there's always jewelweed to make you not sting anymore out there. So again, nettles have highly nutri nutritious greens, uh, which can be neutralized through cooking or drying the leaves. Ideally, the young leaves are the best to harvest because they don't have as much of those hairs yet that are going to give you that stinging, irritating feeling. So getting out there ahead of the season when they're young and early and definitely before they go to seed because then the leaves tend to become a little bit bitter. Like most wild edibles, as they mature, the leaves just become more bitter. So the younger the leaves, the better. The identifying features for stinging nettle you can kind of see in the photo here how they grow opposite leaves. So again, you're going to have a pair of leaves growing from the same growing point opposite of each other. They are coarsely toothed leaves. That tooth is an uh, identifiable feature, meaning like serrated or jiggity edges on the leaves. So they have these margins um, and they can grow several inches long. So the younger the leaves, the smaller, but a fully mature leaf can be two to three inches long. The young leaves, again pictured, you can see they appear more heart-shaped, but the more mature they get, you kind of lose that little bit of dip on the top. So the heart-shaped leaves aren't always a good identifier. The flowers are arranged in catkins, so clusters, flowers, and catkins. I tend to remind people of how weeping willows go to seed and how they have these like little seed pod heads. That's what a catkin is. Um, so again, pictured there, you can kind of see how the catkin looks on a stinging nettle plant. There, are, there is a difference between male and female plants, but for the sake of wild foraging, the leaves, they're edible on both, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. My caution to you is, again, going for stinging nettles, please, please, please wear gloves and long sleeves. You will thank me later. 
or you will slowly burn and pay this, the consequences <laughs> because it fights back. It definitely does not want to be eaten. Um, I, I wrote down the full list of how I prepare stinging nettle because I want to make sure that it is stressed that stinging nettle, like some plants, there is prep before you can ingest. This is not a trail nibble plan. Prior to cooking this, you will have to clean them. I tend to clean all of my plants before preparation. That's just, again, good hygiene practices. You never know what you're bringing home. There's still bugs out there, right? Um, so you want to clean them. You also want to make sure you have gloves on when you're washing them, or the easiest way is blanching. So if you don't know what blanching is, it's basically boiling, it's boiling them in hot water and then changing out the water and doing it again. Each time you blanch them and switch out the water, those fine hairs and the histamine on them gets washed away. So it becomes more neutralized every time you blanch them. Once they're blanched, then you can pretty much handle them normally and you can treat them like you would any other greens. So you can make collard greens out of stinging nettles. They're really tasty. I just saute them up in butter most of the time. Um, but just like with, I don't know, spinach or most greens, you do need a lot of stinging nettles to get a decent amount to eat. If anybody's ever cooked spinach, you know you take a whole bag and it just sets into a little pile pretty quickly. So be conscious of when foraging for stinging nettles, you do need quite a bit to get a, a, a decent meal out of it. Spice bush. I'm gonna say this so much, but again, one of my favorite wild edibles. And the reason for spice bush being that is because not only is a very common understory shrub that helps outcompete the invasive bush honeysuckle that is wrecking havoc in Indiana and like so many other places, but spice bush is so easy to identify because it's one of those, you pick the leaf and you smell it. There, there are lots of other identifying features, but when in doubt, being able to crush a leaf and smell it to confirm you know it is what it is, is so, again, it's rewarding to know, you feel confident that, okay, now I know I can ingest it. So it's often considered the forsythia of the wild. If you do know what the bush forsythia is, it's the early, yellow flowering bush that people like to plant around their houses. Well, this one is the native variety that does yellow flower in the early spring before it goes to leaf, pictured in more of the top picture. And it's very common again in lowland forest habitats. It's pretty much the dominant understory shrub in most of the parks around Bloomington. And once you crush up either the flower, the leaf, the stem, the berries, they all have this aromatic quality to them. And it's a, it's a spicy quality. And that's another reason why it has the name, spice bush. It didn't just come out of thin air. It has a spicy, very distinct flavor and smell to it. So the identifying features. It is deciduous tree. Um, it grows anywhere from six to 12 feet tall, understory. It's an, it, the leaves are alternate. And alternate and opposite leaves are an important way for any botanist to identify woody species. So an alternate leaf, let's assume this is a branch. That means that a branch is going to come out every other growing point. It's growing alternatively, alternately, as opposed to opposite branching, meaning they grow from the same growing point. So if this was a branch, a branch would grow out from each sides from the same growing point. For botanists, not many woody plants grow oppositely. So that's another, again, a good way to rule out a lot of species. So when I say it grows alternately or oppositely, I'm talking about the branching and where it's on the growing point. The leaf is actually smaller at the beginning and gets fatter as it goes. So another popular plant to describe that shape is pawpaw leaves tend to do that or chinkapin species tend to do that. So it is pictured in the spice bush. It starts off small and gets wider as it, it, it grows. The fruit of the spice bush, I did include both pictures there. It starts off green and then turns to red later in the season. Those berries are edible, but they're very, very bitter, so I don't recommend just eating them off the bush. They're better dried and actually ground into an alternative spice, um, allspice. 
Um, the leaves can also be eaten raw or cooked like you would many of the other greens mentioned. So like sauteed, butter, boiled, things like that. But my favorite way to eat or enjoy this plant is to make it into a tea. For new foragers, teas are the best way to start using these plants because it doesn't take a lot of prep. It really is just boiling and steeping them in it. And the cool thing about spice bush, you don't even need the leaves. In the winter or the fall, you can go there and cut some twigs and boil those and you get that same tasting, same aromatic tea that you would using the leaves. So spice bush tea, I'm sorry we couldn't eat in person because I always bring some with me when I have wild edible hacks. Um, and I, I lemon and sugar to taste, or honey, I should say, honey and lemon to taste if you're still in mind. Honeysuckle flowers. So I mentioned spice bush, I have to mention honeysuckle. This is specifically bush honeysuckle, although Japanese honeysuckle flowers are edible as well. I want us all to do our part and eat as many weeds and invasive species as we can. And it really will make a difference. The more people eat invasive flowers, the less chances they can go to seed. So I wasn't just being funny when I clued it at the bottom to, to do your part, but eating invasive flowers helps reduce the chances of their spread. So I wanted to include honeysuckle flowers and also because it's peak season for them, it's all in bloom. I'm sure you guys have smelled them. They grow commonly not just in woodlands, but pretty much all over in property lines. Honeysuckle is a deciduous wooded shrub that grows in a variety of, of sites, as I mentioned. This one does opposite branch. So again, opposite meaning it's gonna grow from the same growing point. Forgive me for not including a better photo to just show that. The leaves are pretty simple. So not many people use the leaves to identify. In fact, they, they misidentify leaves with other native species all the time. So it's, uh, at this time of year, it's important to point out more of the, the flowers. So the flowers are a two-lipped tubular flower and they have evolved uh, for species like hummingbirds and butterflies and things that use uh, the proboscis or a straw-like mouth to suck nectar. So that is why the shape is more tube-like, which also means for us, I know it's gonna be sweet tasting. And that is why we're talking about honeysuckle today is because they are sweet to eat and raw. So if you are looking for a trail nibble, you're looking for something to just spice up a salad or make something look a little pretty, I've also seen somebody freeze these in ice cubes at a baby shower, which was interesting. But again, in addition to this and violet flowers and stuff, there's a lot of edible flowers that are fun for both adults and children to learn. I can pick that and eat it. With that in mind though, if I want to eat it because it's sweet and tasty, there's bound to be something else that might want to eat it because it's, it's sweet and tasty. So before just ever ingesting flowers, you best believe that I always check inside to make sure there's not some sort of little creepy crawly living in there or hanging out before I'm eating it. I have a recipe included on the slides, by the way, that you will be included, and it's, gonna, it's for the honeysuckle flower syrup. So flower syrup can be used for violets too and some other ones that I mentioned, but it's, it's fun to be able to go out there and collect so many honeysuckle flowers, a good activity and a good way to again reducing it from going to seed. So give it a shot, honeysuckle flower syrup. Uh, you can use it to sweeten homemade lemonade or iced tea. Um, again, good time of year to be making some of that at home. You can also use it as a sweetener for any sort of baked goods or pancakes, things like that, if you want to have a sweet floral taste to anything. Also had ice. All right, curly dock. Curly dock is a very common weed found both in backyards and woodlots and prairies. And this plant was actually brought over, which is really interesting enough, because of its, its ability to grow pretty much in any condition and because of that nice, refreshing, sour taste to it. So very much like that wood sorrel we started the presentation off, the curly dock also has the oxalate acid that could become hazardous to people with kidney or liver issues. So 
be cautious when ingesting curly dock if you have under any of those underlying conditions. The identifying characteristics or features for curly dock is the fact that it grows from a basal rosette form, meaning it grows in one dense cluster on the ground. So uh, you're going to picture maybe dandelions or how those weeds, they grow from a central base on the ground or on the floor. And the leaves radiate, radiate out from that same growing point. Um, curly dock leaves are also very long. They're long, I'm sorry, they're long ovals. And they all attached from like the same general growing point as I already mentioned and grow into a very distinct tip or point. The leaves, once they mature, they start to get a little wrinkly or uh, crinkly, and that's actually where they get their name from, which the Latin name Crispus comes from, but Curly Dock too, that's how I usually remember, Curly Leaves, Curly Dock. The, the red mid-vein isn't always very distinguishable on all of the plants, especially the young Curly Dock, so it's not always the most reliable way to identify this plant. However, it, it's the easiest one to identify from, from far away. And if you see some in the area, they tend to repropagate. So if you look around, you're going to find more curly duck. And hopefully you're able to find younger variations of that curly duck. Because as I mentioned earlier, the more mature the plant gets, the more bitter the leaves taste. Um, so the younger, the better. Um, from early to mid spring, so the young leaves are tasty. You can eat them raw or cooked. You can treat them basically how you would any other greens. Again, you can salt them up in butter, you can add them into a salad, things of that nature. If you are going to use the raw leaves though, avoid using excessive amounts and also avoid eating the mid vein. Um, it tends to be a little rough, so kind of like how you use kale, you just break off. The, the foliage part of it and you discard the main vein part because it doesn't cook well, it never really softens up. And so just for cooking purposes, no reason to, to fight through that. Common green briar. By the way, if you're starting to notice a trend, I have a lot of these plants in my backyard and you might not even live in a forested lot, but we're fortunate in Indiana, Southern Indiana, to be surrounded by a lot of forest habitat. So it's not uncommon for us to be able to find this in a more developed area. All right, so the common green briar, this is gonna be one of two vines that we're gonna really concentrate on today. So this vine is more um, herbaceous in nature because it stays green. So in the lower picture, you can see the vein, or I'm sorry, the vine there is a light green color. You also can make out a little bit of the tendrils or little wispies, that's how the green briar grows and grabs itself. It sends out these tendrils to reach the next available, let's say, branch or plant or in the top picture, fence. And over time, it slowly lifts itself up. Uh, like most plants, it's trying to reach sun access. Um, it can pretty much grow anywhere. And it is really common and it's harder to find in woodlands because how it likes to wrap around other plants. So if you're out there foraging for greenbriar, I would say that going later in the season to get it when it's mature and leaves are big and marking it to follow up in the earlier spring when they're young, because when they're young, you'll see on the, the virtual hike, I could have easily mistaken that for just a leaf of the plant it was growing off of. So it might become easier as the season progresses to identify it. But once you know it, it really is one of my favorite tra trail nibbles too, because it's an invasive weed, um, or I shouldn't say invasive, but it can be a weed, it can choke out natives. Um, so we do wanna do our part. Identifying features besides it being a vine is it does have thorns, so be cautious. Any wild edible you have to forage with thorns, I just say that's why we wear gloves. Um, it also has those heart-shaped leaves, like so commonly, like are a lot of plants. The very noticeable uh, veins on the back end there that are actually 3D. So if you touch the back of the plant, you'll be able to feel those veins protrude out. Not all plants have that. 
It is a very bright green color, and in my opinion, it almost has a neon look to it comparative, compared to other plants out in the field that you were looking at. It pops to me. So once you start to become familiar with these plants, you're going to start to see those slight variations in the color green that they all share. But this one does have a very bright color green. Um, it does go to flower. The flowers stay green, so they're not as showy and definitely not as appreciated or, or easily identifiable as opposed to the berries that turn bluish black color in the late summer. So again, knowing how things look in the season, I wouldn't recommend necessarily foraging this plant in the late summer because of the bitter quality to the mature leaves, but they're still edible at that point. So uh, green briars are as good as asparagus and salad. Uh, they're cooked by using the young shoots, the leaves, and the tendrils. So again, those little curly things shooting off, those are edible too. If the rootstocks of these vines are crushed and washed, a red powder can be boiled in water and actually made into a mild jelly. I have not done this successfully, but I'm still trying to. I'll, be, I'll admit that. Um, I like the idea of being able to use a more naturalized jelly form for other cooking and baking things. Uh, this powder um, can be ha mixed with wheat flour too to create a thickening agent, so it is used as a substitute uh, from flour from time to time. But for new novice foragers, again, raw, it can be eaten raw, it can be used as a salad substitute, it can be used as a substitute to asparagus or, or, or even spinach. Um, but if you're cooking it like spinach, you're going to need a lot of leaf. Okay, wild grapevine. We do have wild grape in Indiana. There are three species that are common around here in the summer, the riverbank and the frost grape. Frost grape being the sweetest, the juiciest of all three, but all three of them are edible. And that includes the leaves and the fruit. Unfortunately, our wild grapes, people get so excited, oh, I'm gonna go out and find grapes. The grapes are very small and they are tart. And so it does take a lot of them to produce the jams or the jellies or things like that. I more like to point out wild grape for the leaves, the edible leaves quality. And, and probably one of the more famous recipes that you all might be aware of are, are dolmas. But we also have a dangerous lookalike. In my opinion, they're easy to distinguish, but for a novice or new, you know, a new forager, you might not be able to tell. So this is a good opportunity to point out dangerous lookalikes and the fact that one could be growing right next to the other. So if you look at the top photo, I have two leaves side by side. I have the wild grapevine on the left showing very serrated or toothed edges. And I have one on the right in a heart shape, much more smooth, soft edges. The soft edge one is the poisonous moon seed. So this is why it's important to know identifiable features of plants, because it, as long as I knew that wild grape needed to have toothed edges, I would be able to distinguish the two apart in the field. They both though are woody vines. So looking at the vine, looking at old growth and seeing that it was a woody substance isn't going to help me. I'm going to need to be able to see leaves to safely identify this. It does go to fruit and those appear like, like you would picture any grapes, purplish blue colors, dark black, uh, things like that nature, but they're smaller than what you would picture probably in like a grape orchard and definitely smaller than the grapes we buy at the grocery store. Fun fact about the wild grapevine, the vines when they get into maturity, which I've seen some get this large around, they tend to give off like a flaky dark wooden uh, like material and it's the popular material used by wild cardinals or northern cardinals to make their nests. So if you have a lot of grapevine in the area, chances are you have a lot of cardinals in the area. Not coincidentally, we have a lot of both in Indiana, but just you know a little bit of that companion plant, but there's also companion wildlife um, in nature. So if I see grapevines, I'm like, oh, it's a matter of time before I hear cardinals and vice versa. So good indicators to be able to find both in the field. 
All right, my recipe for that one is the ripe grape can be eaten raw, but again, tastes better after the first frost and you do need quite a lot. And if making jams, you actually end up using sugar to sweeten it. So I don't really get excited about the grapes. All right, Violet. So this one is probably not new for all of you, but maybe new for some. Violets are common in, again, yards, woodlands, pretty much all throughout Indiana. We do have a variety of them. Today we're going to be talking about the woodland varieties of violets, just because that's what we're going to see on our, our hike. But the colors of the flower could vary. So sometimes people get confused because they think, no, violets have to be violet, right? They have to be a purplish color. Wrong. They can be white. They can be yellow. They can be various shades of purple that almost look pink. So it's not really about identifying the flower, but the leaves. So just like with many of the wild edibles, it's heart-shaped leaves and they are seri or serrated. So if you look closely at the bottom photo, as opposed to sharp tooth edges, these ones have a little bit rounder edges to them, still has the heart shape to them. Those can be small. They can also grow up to two, three inches wide, depending on the maturity of the violet and where it's growing. Both the flowers and the leaves are edible. They're high in vitamin A and C. They can be eaten raw in salads, cooked as greens, candied and made into jellies. I also mentioned the really cute wedding shower or baby shower, I'm sorry, that had violets and ice cubes. They put them in drinks, make maple or violet syrup. The internet is full of recipes. And fortunately for us, for you, the recipes are easy. All you need is a good population, good haul of violets. And because they grow so commonly and they spread so widely, it's really easy to get enough violet flowers or even violet leaves to make a meal out of it. So if you're interested in doing so, um, I just tell you probably walk out your back door and you can find a decent amount or go to any public disturbed area and can find them. Just make sure the, safe, the, the site is safe and unpolluted as much as possible. Um, and if you do want to propagate violets yourself, they spread by rhizomes. So again, by root and very easily to spread and propagate. So if you introduce some into your garden bed, chances are next year it's going to overtake your garden bed. So just be aware that they can be slightly aggressive. If you do not recognize the photo on the screen, by the way, I'm not even going to include it in our discussion today, but that is a new growth of pasta. And hostas, new growth, when they look like that, are edible. And there's a reason why deer like to eat your hostas too. I don't like hostas personally, that's because I'm a native buff, but they are really common around yards and they're nice, they're nice yard plants, but you're gonna have to fight the deer for them. All right, let's start off with a really easy one. Um, dandelions. Common nuisance should actually be treated more of a treasure because every single part of this plant has a use, has a benefit. And not only are they beneficial being one of the first sources of food for our pollinators in the summertime, um, it, could, it was also part of the first source of protein and food and nutrients for people in early spring when, when nutrients and things like that in the winter time were lackluster. Uh, the common uses of this are that people have ground up, <clears throat> excuse me, they grind up the roots to use as a coffee substitute. Personally, I don't care for the taste of the ground dandelion root, but if, if some people love it, absolutely love it. Um, I, I like to eat the salad greens, so people really easily identify the flower. They often overlook the greens, but they're completely edible. And I did include a picture of the four different variations of the dandelion leaf um, at the bottom right corner, but those are completely edible too. Um, and then I mentioned the, the root already, but the flower, you can also eat the flower. I have ba uh, battered the flower and fried them and made dandelion fritters before. It, it has an earthy taste, but there's something refreshing about that dandelion taste to me as opposed to as a coffee substitute. So I, I have included that recipe as well if you want to ever try to make dandelion fritters. 
identifying features, um, I, I, you know, I didn't really say bright yellow flowers, fluffy seed heads. And that's because most people already commonly know dandelion, but some little fun fact for you. Um, the English name dandelion is a combination of French dent de lion, meaning lion's tooth, referring to the coarsely tooth leaves. And so people actually thought it was a lion's mane that it was named after, but it was more about the lion's teeth or tooth. The every petal on a dandelion is actually an individual flower. And that's true for all flowers in the Asteraceae or Aster family, which is the largest group of flowers, of species of flowers. My tips for you guys interested in harvesting dandelion, which again, should probably be commonly around your house right now, would be to harvest the young leaves and those can be eaten raw or can be cooked in like any other greens. You can use the leaves and roots um, as a substitute for coffee. I already mentioned that, sorry. Um, but you want to be conscious when harvesting this plant because it's often considered a nuisance. It's often also targeted by pesticides and, you know, weed killers, things like that. So I want you to be sure that this plant has not been treated prior to you ingesting it because that is a quick way for you to get sick or something way worse. So um, I like to mention chicory after going over dandelion because these two can kind of be interchanged in their uses of the root. The root for chicory can be used as a coffee substitute as well. It is also part of the aster family. It is also a common weed that you find all throughout Indiana. Um, it is not in flower yet, but that doesn't mean that you can't start finding the leaf stalks growing up uh, along roadsides or cracks or many disturbed areas. They, they tend to look a little scraggly, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, um, because they get kind of leggy when they're growing very tall. In fact, they can grow um, almost three feet tall at times. The basil leaves are lanced, and what that means is they have a long protruding uh, point at the end. So in, when I say basil leaves, I'm talking about growing close to the stem. So those first little basil um, leaflets that come out close to the stalk are the new growth. The flowers are a light purple or a light blue, depending on who you ask. I see blue, my friends say purple. So that's where, again, you have to use a couple identifying features. But once you know the color in your mind, it really helps to be able to see these from a distance. Um, and I just, with this one, just like the dandelion, you want to be aware of people spraying. You just want to be aware of chicory likes to grow in those disturbed areas, like the roadsides, like train crossings. And so emissions, absorbing emissions, is not just what's in the water. It is what's, what's in the air, what's in the soil. Plants absorb what's around them. And so if you ingest a plant that's absorbed some sort of toxins, it's eventually going to enter your body. So just being aware of where you're harvesting and foraging for your foods. I hope someone's keeping track of how many times I'm gonna say that throughout today's presentation. All right, <clears throat> purple dead nettle. Dead nettle is an early spring bloomer, commonly found again about backyards, disturbed areas. It is aggressive, so you usually don't just find one purple dead nettle, there's usually an abundance around. It's the leaves and the flower of this plant that are edible and that you're gonna to wanna to forage for because they are packed full of vitamin A, C, and iron. And they do have a little bit of a sweet aftertaste. And so again, those flowers, a little bit of that sweet nectar in there, gives it a little sweet back note. So I, I do <clears throat> pick and ingest this every once in a while, but small doses and I can't as easily inspect the little flowers on this plant. So I, I have been more hesitant to eat this on the go without preparing it, just because I don't really know what's going on under there. Uh, again, the, the flower and the leaves, they can be prepared like any other leafy green. Uh, they can be in raw or cooked. Purple denel uh, is commonly added to soups, salads, smoothies, um, pasta salads. Basically any other way you would use a leafy, leafy green vegetable. Uh, you can also use the leaves on external wounds or cuts. I should have mentioned this in the beginning too that today I'm focusing a lot on just what's edible. 
the great things about wild edible plants is they also have so many medicinal benefits to them. So this has got a twofer because it's got anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antifungal properties to it. But when you apply this to the external wounds or cuts uh, as a poultice, which a poultice means you're going to break it up or chew it up. So if I was in the field, I would take these leaves, chew it up in my mouth, much like plantain, which we'll talk about, and then apply that to my wound. Um, so it's used as like a basically a homemade salve in a way. And it can relieve, relieve allergy symptoms. Identifying features, um, it does grow in these clumps and has a square stem because it's in the mint family. So mint family, that's one of the characteristics that they all share is a very a distinguishable square stem. So it's got four sides to the stalk to it. And the, co the color, again, purple pink, I usually see the color pop first and those purplish tinted leaves before anything else. They stand out against the, the grass in my yard. All right, onion grass, great start for any forager and because it's just a good garnish for a lot of different dinner options or me, I like them on my scrambled eggs, but you can use onion grass like you would chive or garlic as a, as a quick, uh, like garlic like grass as a garnish. This is one of the first things to pop up in the spring. It grows really fast. Sometimes people mistake it for grass in itself and just think, wow, why is that one patch of grass? All you need to do, do really to distinguish it is go break off part of it and give it a smell. Grass does not have that potent of an onion smell. In fact, walking up to it, you might already start to smell it because of that distinct smell. Um, the actual stem itself is hollow. So if you are smell impaired for any reason, you could still break it and realize that it's completely hollowed out. If that wasn't enough for you, you could get out your weed knife and start to dig a bit and you would eventually discover that it's growing from a bulb, just like all onion plants. So that bulb can be used um, for cooking as well. But if you are hoping that the plant comes back next year, you're going to want to leave that bulb and those roots behind because that's how it's going to repropagate next year. If you're a gardener who's got too much of this in your house or in your garden, in your yard, you'll know that really all it takes is one little piece of that bulb for it to come back next year, as much as you might not want it to. The onion grass does go to flower, although many people sometimes miss it because it's a small window. The flower has a six petal white little indiscreet, or in, a very discreet flower. Um, so it's not the most useful tool to identify, especially when we have the above mentioned of the smell, the bulb, other things that before you even need to worry about the flower. Um, wild onion does look really similar to wild garlic, um, but I don't have to really give you a caution because ingesting wild garlic isn't going to give you any sort of different reaction. It almost even tastes very similar. Um, so they can be kind of used interchangeably the same way, especially even in cooking. You can eat this raw, another way to, to make sure that it is what you think it is. Lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters is kind of like spinach. Um, in fact, that is why it was brought over here and grown in agricultural production was as a spinach alternative. And because of its weed-like tendencies or aggressive growing tendencies, it can grow anywhere, it can spread everywhere. In fact, you probably have it in your yards right now without you even trying. So now you know though, it is edible and you can enjoy it. Um, the leaves are, the I see triangles, although the more mature they get, they can kind of lose that triangular shape and they become more serrated again with maturity. These toothed edges do have more of a point to them as opposed to the violets we discussed uh, previously. The stalk can be anywhere from, you know, one to two feet. They, the leaves do grow out oppositely, so from the same growing point out. The entire plant is covered in fine waxy powder, so from a distance it looks like a, like a sagey green, a gray green. And it's because of these small white hairs that cover the leaves that give it this, again, different color green compared to the other wild edibles around you. 
um, I, when I eat this plant, again, like all, I only eat it, the young, small leaves. The taller it gets, the more mature, big the leaves, the bitter it is, and the more those fine hairs tend to rub off and just gives it a weird texture in your mouth. So I only eat them when they're young. I tend to weed this out of my garden in the early spring when I'm prepping my beds for replanting. And that's when they're the most enjoyable. The wilting the greens allows your body to absorb and consume more. But what that means is if you, if you cook them, it's you're gonna allow the nutrients and the vitamins to be absorbed in your body quicker but you can still ingest those nutrients raw. It's just a matter of, again, thinking of how you prepare certain plants can activate certain qualities or characteristics in them. So this would be like, like spinach, cooking spinach um, can activate some of those other vitamins and iron, but eating raw spinach is still packed full of iron and nutrients and vitamins. So the same goes for lamb's quarter. Salads, stir fries, omelets, smoothies, um, it's also great as a pizza topping, and I always do, like with most greens, coat it in olive oil. That's all it takes. You just you want to kind of like soften up, especially the more mature the trees or the, the leaves are that you harvest, the more likely you are going to want to add olive oil to help tenderize those leaves to make it more palatable for you. Cleavers, sometimes known as bed straw. And in fact, that's because back in the day, they actually used to use dried up cleavers as mattress filler or bed filler. So that's where that came from. Cleavers has slowly crept into the culinary world, or at least has made a reawakening in, in the wild foraging books for me because it's a, it's a very rough plant. And when you go to touch it the first time, it's going to feel like sandpaper. And when you're considering eating something, the idea of that sandpaper texture in your tongue, I don't know, it just doesn't always good right, but you can consume cleavers raw in salads or on sandwiches. However, I highly recommend you steam or cook them down. Again, adding that olive oil, tenderizing them down, removing a little bit of that, that rough uh, texture to it, so it's a little bit more enjoyable for you to ingest. Um, other than just that like texture rough feeling to identify this plant, it does grow very long and have these oblong or oval shaped leaves that grow uh, opposite from the same growing point. Uh, they're pictured in all the pictures you can kind of see, it's almost like, a, like palm trees, how they all leaf out from the same growing point there. The one side of the leaf is hairy, um, and the other side has more of a spine-like feel to it, all hairs, and that's again what gives it that like grabbing or rough feature. If you're lucky, you can also throw these at friends and they tend to pick, like clothes or like, I'm sorry, attach to people's clothes. Another way to identify, you know, what you're working with. Cleavers do have a very small and conspicuous flower uh, that are four white petals. This is common with plants in the mustard fam family, those four white petals or four petal flowers. So when you're unsure, it's not just about the feeling and location, looking for flowers, things like that um, can help you with cleavers. I wanna point out that cleavers, much like stinging, uh, stinging nettles, do not like to be messed with and they will fight back in the sense that if I handle cleavers without skin protection, I get a reaction. Um, it's like a small hive. It, it goes away in a few minutes, but you have a negative dermal reaction when handling cleavers. So I just remind you to wear gloves and long, uh, long sleeves whenever foraging wild edibles, um, especially if you might have more skin allergies like I do. Garlic mustard. One of the best wild edibles to teach, learn, and eat. And that is because, yes, it's invasive and unfortunately wrecking havoc on our ecosystems, but that means that you as a forager can probably find a lot of it. And when you do go out there and harvest as much as you want, you can feel good about what you're doing because you're protecting and improving the ecosystem out there. 
Garlic mustard is also very easily identifiable and easy to prepare into different foods. So at the beginning of the presentation, I had a photo of some uh, garlic mustard pesto that I've made and I've shared with many people before. I'm willing to include that uh, recipe as well. This garlic mustard was originally introduced from Europe on purpose in the sense that they knew that it was a weed-like, it would just basically be able to be established in any kind of habitat and because it had so many earth, uh, uses both edibly and medicinally. So it was on purpose, like many invasive plants. We messed up, we didn't know better. So now it's on us to do our part and go out there and eat as much garlic mustard as we can. It is easily found in both shade and sunny areas. I found it, unfortunately, both at RCA on our nat my nature hike as well as in my front yard. So it can be found in both woodlands and disturbed areas. The first year of the plants um, don't actually grow up and go to flower. They stay in a more small uh, rosette basal shape. So again, close to the ground, small leaves. They, they look more kidney or heart shaped. Honestly, people mistakenly identify it as violets often because same growing habitat, same color, same heart-shaped tooth leaf. So all of this can be hard to identify. But if I needed to, de to decide which is which, one of the best, best ways to do garlic mustard is again, pick that leaf, crush it up. Garlic mustard is gonna have a distinct garlicky, mustardy smell. So if I wanna know if it's violet or garlic, Smell test. Um, as this plant gets more mature, it does start to send out a stalk. You can see a dense patch of garlic mustard growing in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, unfortunately, that was the woodlot behind my house. It can spread easily because of the amount of seeds garlic mustard puts out. And so that's why later in the year, once it goes to flower and seed, if you do want to fight against garlic mustard, you can't just pull it and leave it. You actually have to pull it and bag it to remove the seed source or also just repropagate. Um, but as a forager, that does mean that there's going to be a bunch next year because if you pull one garlic mustard and you don't get the seed or you don't get the whole root, you're just making it angry. And next year it's going to come back with hundreds of friends to try to outcompete you. So again, be uh, mindful of what you're foraging and the more you knock around trees and flowers, the more chances of you are spreading um, seed around. So another good thing about it, I just mentioned, clean your boots and all of your tools in between parks, in between sites, in between everything. Just try to keep every, your tools clean so you're not uh, transporting invasive seeds from one park, one site to the other. Um, again, I, I point out garlic mustard after we talk about cleavers because in the mustard family, as you can see, small white flower with four distinct petals. All the mustard families have these four distinct petals on their, on their flowers. So if you are looking and you find the mature plant and it's got these heart-shaped leaves that are toothed and serrated and you see the white flower with four petals, the last thing you're going to do just to confirm, break a leaf off, smell it. It's going to smell like garlic mustard. Plantain, great common edible with wonderful medicinal benefits too. As mentioned earlier about salves and, and, and pulverizing, um, that's what you do for plantain. And if you've ever gotten a, a bee sting, your mom or family member might have said, just go grab some plantain, chew it up, stick it on there. It works. There's a reason for it. So plantain is great, not just for medicinal reasons, but it's also edible. It is common all throughout Indiana, disturbed areas in forested lands, but it does like sunshine. So when you find plantain in forested areas, it tends to be more in areas where the canopy might have opened up and allowed more sunshine to go through. So it, it likes its sun. You'll find it in open lawns, grass fields, prairies, things like that, um, very abundantly. The entire plant is edible. Um, however, however, like many edibles, the more mature the leaves get, the more bitter and harder it is to eat. So younger leaves, better. It is found in all parts of the world. And it, but it's not to be confused with banana-like plantain. 
It's been used by humans for food and herbal remedies for centuries and usually find plantains in wet areas. But again, it does like full sun. The oval shape of the leaf is also very ribbed, meaning again, the veins in that leaf almost are, have a 3D effect. So if you flipped over the leaf and felt the underside of it, the veins would be, um, would stick out to you and be very textured, much similar to how the green briar was that we mentioned earlier in the presentation. The leaves can grow about six inches to about four inches wide. And as I mentioned, it's best to eat them young, but you can eat them as they mature. They just get to be a little bit more bitter tasting, but they're still high in vitamin A and calcium and as well as vitamin C. So still good to eat, even though they're a little bit bitter. They just might need a little bit more of that um, olive oil and tenderizing before you go to ingest as opposed to the young leaves you could eat raw as trail nibble. Pineapple weed, sometimes called wild chamomile. A lot of people don't give this plant as much love as it deserves because it's just really low growing. The flower is exactly how it looks there. It doesn't actually put out any noticeable petals, so it's not really showy. And so it's treated like an unfortunate dandelions are treated, like a nuisance weed. When in reality, there are so many uses for this wonderful plant, especially in tea. So if you're interested in, in trying out pineapple weed, like many of the wild edibles, teas are an easy way to break into enjoying them. Where you would find pineapple weed is in disturbed areas, cracks in the sidewalks, growing as, again, a weed in your garden along uh, property lines, things like that. It is low growing, so maximum height of about 30 centimeters, which is probably why you never noticed it. Uh, its leaves are feathery, in, in, or I describe them as lacy or doily. So you can see in the photo to the left, um, it's, it's not what you picture of, of, of a herbaceous leaf. It's, again, light, feathery. It also grows alternately along the stem, so every other growing point. And the flower, even though it's got no petals, does have a yellowish tint to it. So it comes off as like a lime green to me from a distance when I'm identifying it. And this will be our last one for the backyard series, common chickweed. Well, I will say it's getting later in the season for common chickweed. In fact, most of mine in my yard started going to seed. And when I went to go forage them, the seeds like to pop in my face and try to go in my eye. So wear glasses when harvesting common chickweed. But it is so common and so abundant and so tasty, it, it still deserves to be mentioned. So this one, again, you'll find all around your yard. It likes moist conditions. So chances are it's growing along where your down pipe is or uh, for your gutters or an area that tends to hold a lot of water when it rains. There's probably chickweed growing around there. The leaves of chickweeds grow opposite of each other. You can again see it in the photo, the top left and top and, and bottom right. They are elliptical shaped, meaning they come out and come to a point too. They grow fat and come to a very distinct point. They can grow up to be about one inch long, although the young leaves are very, very small. There are tiny hairs growing on the leaves and the stem, which you can kind of make out in the top corner. And if you remember, you know, the beginning I said, watch out for tiny hairs. This is what I mean by saying some plants are okay to ingest, even if they share some of those characteristics of the plants to be watch out for. The flowers of the common chickweed are white with double petals. And what that means is at first glance, you might tell me that has 10 petals on it, when in reality, it actually only has five petals, and they're just two, it's a paired petals connected at the base. So this is where those little nifty hand lenses come into use when you're trying to identify on the field, because it's those small distinctions that can differentiate between one species and the other. If in doubt, one cool little trick that common chickweed does is it does reveal a starchy layer. So if you go to pull the leaves apart, you actually see these little strings of membrane that want to hold the plant together. 
that if you then pull it, it will hang onto itself and let's over pull, then it'll hang off. But it's got a starchy inner layer that is, is uh, helpful to identify when looking for chickweed. Um, again, they usually appear between May and June and you can eat the leaves raw or, or boiled. They're high in vitamins and minerals uh, with a light crispy flavor. But if you eat too much at once of this, it has been known, has been known to be a stool loosener. So everything again in doses, but specifically common chickweed. If you're feeling a little bit backed up, maybe you can seek out some chickweed because too much of this could be used to uh, loosen the stool a bit. So I just overwhelmed all of you with so much information on plants. What we're gonna do next is go on a virtual hike together. I was supposed to hold this program at RCA Community Park in Bloomington. It's a wonderful hidden gem in Bloomington that incorporates a large natural area as well as developed park, urban area, surrounded by residential um, neighborhoods. So it's, it's, what is it, 47 acres of wooded lands, of a prairie strip, of open lawns that has a little bit of everything that we discussed today. So I wanted to go out there still and hike the area and just film some of the different uh, habitats and scenes that you could actually find these plants in. All right, so welcome to RCA Community Park. Again, it's basically just a nice dead end road in the middle of a beautiful neighborhood in the southwest portion of Bloomington. I'm going to be starting off at Shelter One, which is near the basketball courts and the parking lot area there. And I will be traveling the entire route all the way around RCA until I end up near the playgrounds um, towards the right or the I'm sorry the east end of the park. Great thing about RCA is you can spend as off as much or as little time in the trails on the trails as you like. We are working hard to install a ADA accessible paved loop trail out at RCA. It won't go through all of the woodland uh, parts of the property but you will still get to experience some of the woodlot as well as some of the prairie habitat out there. But I do implore you all, if you haven't been out to check out RCA Park before, it's a great place to take friends and family, um, take your dog walking. And again, you're able to spend a good a couple hours on the interior trails of RCA. And on my earlier hikes, I have even gotten lost out there. But if you just stay to the right at every trail split, you'll eventually end up at your back on your way out. All right, species number one. All right, down number one. So imagine that while this looks a little bit more wooded, this could be any disturbed site. It could be in your yard. It could be along a railroad or a road. Now, what is that plant? It's got a really noticeable purple hue to the leaves as well as a purple pink flower. Growing really abundantly, as you can see, spreading aggressively throughout this whole property here. So what species do you think that is? Write it down. At the end, we'll go over all the species. That's my friend, Jewelweed which is the species I refer to that can help you stop itching when you find stinging nettle is impacting you, but I'll show you that again when we find the stinging nettle. All right, plant number two. What is this green common plant? Looks like it's got some very distinguishable 3D under vein. And just to remind you, we are in a disturbed site What am I holding in my hand there is plant three. Kind of looks like clover, but a little bit lighter. All right, plant four here. This is growing 
a rosette shape. It's got a very clear red midrib or mid main vine or vein. So sorry. So what is that plant? Oh no! And what's that? Every forager's worst nightmare. Poison ivy. All right, let's look for some common shrubs, understory shrubs. Didn't have to go far to find this first one. So what's plant number five? Is this common understory shrub? Pretty simple leaves. Seems to be growing alternately. Bark is gray with some white speckles. I still don't know. How do I figure it out? Crush it up and smell it. So what shrub would I crush up and smell to identify? That's going to be species five. All right, what's that yellow flower? Species six. What do you think number six is? Looking at the yellow flower, looking at the leaf, the very toothed leaf. So many wild edibles at RCA Park. All right, species number six. Don't let that purple flower fool you. We're actually just looking at these leaves here, these heart-shaped leaves that, is, that were toothed with round edges. Normally, people identify that plant with flower. All right, plant number seven. What is this long, stringy looking thing? Looks like I see little white flowers with four petals. Looks so you can see the little hairs on that. That's gonna be a rough plant. Probably feels like sandpaper. So what's number seven? Here's a little taste of some of the new paved trails we've installed at RCA Park. The project is about 85% done. We're actually just trying to cross some of the more difficult um, spots that involve uh, washouts and waterways. So just working on tidying up that. We're about to enter again, common Indiana forest habitat, dense understory, bottom herbaceous layer and a mature canopy of forested trees. Ooh, elderberry. I'm gonna come back for that one later this June. If you don't know anything about elderberry, great super fruit. So a little bit of the bummer about paving trails is some trees have to come down, but fortunately all of the mature trees that had to come down for this project were all ash trees that unfortunately had already been um, overrun by emerald ash borer. So they were gonna have to be taken down anyway because of the hazardous nature of ash trees after they've been overtaken by emerald ash borer. So we had to take them down anyway. All right, I am now transitioning off the paved trail onto the natural trails out at RCA. And during my hike, I'm definitely going to keep in mind this leave no trace principle of like, when I see a puddle, I'm not gonna walk around it, you walk through it, just to make sure that you're not widening the trail and impacting the habitat any more than you need to. Okay, this is a good practicing one. I'm gonna stop. I thought I was gonna walk right into that, but I knew before touching it, by the way, while that looks like poison ivy, it's got a leaf of three, it even has a little mitten shape. There's actually the native box elder tree that people often call poison ivy tree because it looks a lot like poison ivy leaves. But as I tracked it, I can see that it's actually a tree growing and not a woody vine that just wrapped itself around a tree and was about to smack me in the face. But you definitely want to be aware of your surroundings. Oh, okay, plant eight. Let's practice plant eight. So plant eight, we're identifying these white flowers. And look at the plant leaves too. They're growing oppositely. So growing from the same growing point. And the bark of the shrub is a light tan bark. So what flower are those from? 
I can see the tube-like feature to them. So likely very sweet, sweet enough that I ate one out there. One of the great things about hiking out at RCA too is we have a bunch of interpretive signs out there. Here's a great example of one talking about tulip poplar trees, which another fun fact, if you didn't know, tulip poplars or yellow poplars are the state tree of Indiana. Here's a beautiful one growing out at RCA. Tulip poplars get the name from their beautiful flower pictured here. So they share some qualities that tulip flowers have. Being a native variation of plants too. Oh, I don't wanna skip this one, sorry. What's this plant? Common understory, heart-shaped leaves, growing in nice dense clusters. I went a little fast, I'm gonna pause for a second. Sorry about that. So this plant here is gonna be plant number nine. heart-shaped, very soft looking. And while I didn't do it here, another good way to identify that would be the smell. All right, what's this plant? It's got white flowers with petals. Here's the same plant, just in a younger form. Let's do that back again. So again, common understory weed plant that's got serrated heart-shaped leaves and a four petal flower. What's this plant? It's gonna be species 10. And again, this is the same plant I just wanted to show you in mature and in new growth form. And you can see just from that shot how much of it was there. This is another warning slide. This is just warning foragers that if you don't know when poison ivy grows on a, as a vine up against trees, it tends to put out little hairs. So if you ever see vines growing on trees with a bunch of little hairs, chances are that's poison ivy and you want to stay clear of that. So always use caution when putting your hands on trees or using things to get up. Look before you touch. That, for instance, is poison ivy leaves growing in a wooded vine, as you can see, and it's wrapping itself around that small tree. And if it was growing right up against this trail, I might have not have noticed it and walked and brushed right up to it. All right, species number 11. So serrated edges growing oppositely from same growing points. And if you look hard enough, let's see if I can zoom my camera in, or I guess I didn't. There were fine hairs along the stem and on the leaves, so fine hairs on that plant. What well, was number 11? Oh, that was jewelweed, by the way. Let's go back, sorry about that. Because anytime I find stinging nettle, I want to find jewelweed. So jewelweed is that plant in the center there. It can create orange flowers. And again, I don't want to go too down the rabbit hole with other species. You guys just learned 20 after all. But if you're going to learn stinging nettle, write down jewelweed next to it because I highly recommend you use it. Um, they both like to grow by water. So it's not surprising that as I panned up, where was I? right by a water source. Nice little footbridge exists out of RCA. All right, species 12. At first didn't even notice it growing along that honeysuckle, but then I saw it. This vine has very pronounced by a veins underneath and in my mind has a bright green color to it so what's what is that vine I definitely ate some of the baby leaves off it too as I walked away all right vine number two number 13 what is the species we're looking at 
This one turns more into a woody vine as it matures. I'm showing you the color here, how the young uh, tendrils are green still, but the actual returning plant is wood. So what was that plant? Now I'm gonna be circling back to the main paved trail after going off trail there for a bit. A beautiful day. As you can see, the canopy is starting to open up and when it allows more sunlight through, that means my plant species are gonna change now. So now that the sun's starting to come in more, I'm gonna be seeing more maybe open prairie, open lawn type species as opposed to more common forested woodlands. And now look how open this spot is. Full sun, you're basically gonna be finding um, yard-like plants now. Osage orange, honorable mention. That plant can help you keep, or using the Osage fruit can help you keep spiders and mice away. So I keep some in my garage. So made it around in its entirety. Just have one more species to quiz you guys in. What is this grass looking like? Wild edible. I picked it. It's hollow. And boy, did it stink. So what was that? That's to get you guys excited about a maple syrup program down the line. And with that, thank you for bearing with me for the virtual hike that I uh, trust me is way more enjoyable in person, but it is still important to practice looking at these plants actually in the field where there's a bunch more um, plants that are crowding your line of sight as opposed to the photos that I'm singling out plants. You know, if they're in the center of the shot, chances are you're looking directly at the plant. But when you're forced to pull them out from other species that might have similar characteristics, that's how you get to learn. All right, well, other than I have a bunch of wild edible resources. I mentioned throughout the presentation that I don't just have one book. I have multiple books that I reference throughout my life when I'm thinking about ingesting something. I also use the app iNaturalist. Um, so if I don't, if I forget my field guide and I need to do something more out in, out in the field and I have internet access or I have, I should say, um, GPS access and stuff like that, I can still find out information. Um, but it's also helpful to be able to seek out other local experts. So Instagram is full of local ladies who are just wild edible gurus who, who create and propagate and, and use wild plants regularly in their day-to-day -day lives. And I know that I attend as many as I can because I'm still always learning and trying to better my, my skills at wild foraging. I don't think I'll ever stop trying to learn plants because there are so many out there. And I just gave you guys a little taste of 20 species. These books are full of hundreds, if not thousands more. So I hope I don't, you don't stop today. And if nothing else that I've inspired you to look into this more and to step outside today and maybe try to find at least one of the 20 species we discussed in this presentation. And on that note, I will turn this over to all of you. Um, I'd love to answer questions, concerns. Um, that wraps up the entirety of my prepared presentation and the virtual hike that we'll be discussing today. I, I had hoped that this would, you know, in person would have lasted about two hours because I would have let, let you guys all gone off and forage yourself. So instead, what I can offer you is today, tomorrow, this week, whenever, if you want to go out and forage and follow up with me ever, and you need to confirm what you're seeing is, in fact, what you're trying to harvest, I would be happy to lend my experience and my expertise to all of you. 
Um, I also hope to be able to offer an in-person version of this workshop later this summer or again this fall because really wild edibles change with the seasons and there's always something awesome and new and tasty to learn about. So with that, again, if, if anybody wants to unmute, um, say anything, share a thought, you know, I like a lot of this is just life experiences, trial and errors. Oh my God, I tried that and it tasted disgusting. Not for me. Now's the time to do it. Hi, Rebecca. Could you tell us um, the list of the plants that we were just supposed to identify? Are you going to give oh, that yes. list of that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. So let's go down that list really quick before we go ahead. So, okay. Number one was purple dead nettle. So again, the easy way to identify purple dead nettle is definitely that purplish tint, those top leaves and the purple pink flowers that it has. It also has a very distinct square stem, being that it's in the mint family, but it doesn't really have a minty odor or taste like you're familiar with other mints. Number two, that was plantain. So plantain is very common and it grows from the ground. So most of the time you probably are looking at plantain, but when in doubt, look underneath the leaf for those 3D veins. Um, to confirm that you do in fact have the plantain. Number three, which did come really fast for you guys, was wood sorrel or sour grass. So it did not have the flower on it, which I was glad about because I don't want to make these too easy for you guys. But wood sorrel, again, kind of looks like clover. It has a lighter green um, tint to it, tends to hold on to its little okra looking like seed pods. But when in doubt, since all clover is edible, you just want to, excuse me, pull a little leaf off, take a nibble, you'll instantly taste the sour taste and be able to confirm um, if in fact you do have wood sorrel. Number four was curly dock. So curly dock, really common weed. Another one that is so aggressive because of, look at all those seed heads on that dark maroon color on the top photo. Those are all of its seeds. So it's kind of, again, one of our jobs to eat as much of this plant as we can to stop it from going to seed. It grows on the ground from a rosette, basil-like growing pattern, and it has a very distinct red or pink tinted midrib. So early doc. Next we saw was the understory shrub, which was the spice bush. Something I didn't mention as I was going through this was the bark of spice bush is a light gray with like a white speckled or white dots on the bark. But it's so easy to distinguish by smell alone that really, if you think you have spice bush, there's so many leaves on it, break a leaf off, smell it. It's okay. You're definitely getting nowhere near 20% of harvesting that plant. A little bit of pruning is fine. Smell, spice bush smell will be your best indicator. Number six, I tried to find the hardest looking violet I could. So if you got that as violet, great job. Um, a lot of the leaves I showed you today are heart shaped and serrated. Um, that wasn't by chance. I also just wanted to show you guys that it's those small little changes and differentiate or different characteristics that help you distinguish between two species. Violets being one of them, once they lose their flowers, it's like people have no idea that they're there. They're still there. Those leaves are still very much edible. So again, number six was violet and it's those heart shaped and rounded serrated edges that help you distinguish the violet. Number seven was cleavers. So cleavers, bed straw, that sand like or sandpaper like leaves, or some people say cat tongue, which is too descriptive for me. Um, it's, it's going to be long, have the um, leaves are all growing out of the same growing point oppositely. And if it's in flower, it's going to have a small white flower with four petals. Chances are you're gonna see it growing without flowers and you're just gonna to have to touch the leaf and it's gonna have that rough feeling and you're gonna be able to feel pretty confident you have cleavers. Um, the next one we had was the honeysuckle flowers. So number eight 
was honeysuckle flowers, white, off-white cream color flowers that have a tube-like appearance that, again, is meant for uh, species like um, butterflies and things that use their, um, a straw-like mouth to drink nectar. It's growing off of a woody shrub common to understory plants in, in Indiana that have opposite branching structures. Everybody go out and eat a honeysuckle flower for me this week, please. Next plant, number nine on our list is wild ginger. So I found quite a bit of wild ginger out there, but not commonly on the trail. So wild ginger, you might have to step off trail to find, but once you do find it, it's everywhere. In fact, if you're familiar with Leonard Springs Park at all, um, wild ginger is everywhere out there because it, it really does like those dark, moist locations. So anywhere that's got any water feature at all, very confidently going to be finding wild ginger. Wild ginger, again, grows heart-shaped with no serrated edges, so smoothed edges there. And if you get close enough to the plant, the stalk has those fine hairs. So if you're looking at the photo with the flower, you can see those fine hairs on the stalk. If you're still not convinced that what you have is wild ginger, you can pull back a leaf from the stem, try to get down to the root as much as possible and smell. Ginger will have that sweet ginger smell or aroma to it. So again, everything that you can smell to confirm, I'm all about teaching. Number 10. Number 10 is garlic mustard. Again, serrated heart-shaped leaves, but more or less you're looking for the small white flowers with four petals on it. And if when in doubt, this is another smell test plant. Break off the leaf, break off the stem. In fact, break the whole plant off, put it in a garbage bag, and carry it away from the property. That's how you know you have garlic mustard. Number 11. Number 11 was stinging nettle. That's dead nettle. I picked the wrong one. Stinging nettle. Stinging nettles. Stinging nettles, very serrated, toothed edges on the leaves growing oppositely or paired, you know, again, growing out from the same growing point. Small fine hairs on the stem and the leaves, so the closer you get, you'll be able to distinguish those. But stinging is also important to know a uh, growth habit, so it likes moist areas close by water features. So I usually uh, look for stinging nettle where I know that there's some sort of stream or, or surface water by nearby. Number 12, was green briar. So this was one of the two <clears throat> vines we talked to, <clears throat> excuse me, today that stays more green throughout the year, does have thorns on it and small little light green tendrils. Reminder, the leaves and the tendrils of this plant are both edible. If you still don't recognize it by the tendrils, the thorn and the vine-like growing pattern, you just turn the leaf upside down and again that 3D vine feeling is going to be included on this vein, the veins again. I'm so sorry guys. <laughs> Two more, number 13 was the wild grapevine. And to the easiest way to tell those two apart is not just the shape of the leaves themselves, which one is um, serrated and one is smooth. It's also grapevine turns into a woody vine. So the more mature, the older it gets, it's going to actually get darker in color and turn to a wood-like material. Um, and I just want to point out again, the way you discern this from the poisonous look-alike is look for the serrated edges. Wild grapevine always has serrated edges. I might have tricked you guys um, on the version I showed you on the hype because grapevine does have three different common shapes it could take, one of which is that pitchfork shape, which I was going to just draw out really quick. This is a horrible grapevine, but pitchfork, right? You have like three distinguishable points to it. Uh, sassafras is another species that does this, mulberry. Trixus botanist. Um, it's like I can't decide what color or shape leaf I want, so I'm going to have all three different kinds of shape leaf. It's tricky, and this is why you want to know other identifiable features to help you make sure it is what it is. All right, last one on our practice list was onion grass. 
So onion grass grows much taller than normal grass, is hollow when picked, and when in doubt, smell it. It is so potently onion and garlicky smelling that you will for sure know that what you have is onion. And it grows all around my house. I put it on my baked potato and eggs almost every day. All right, and I'm sorry we had to end on 14, by the way. I was really confident that I was gonna find a couple more species, but I couldn't find the rest of our list, at least at RCA that day, um, but they are out there. And I would be happy to, again, at this point, if anyone had any questions about what they saw, why they weren't able to ID them correctly, happy to answer. So one other question I have is um, if you could send us a list of the books that you uh, showed. Yes. Uh, Definitely. And I will also include that this slide that's on the PowerPoint will be still in the PowerPoint, but I will happily pull off even more. Um, I, this is my all time favorite. And again, I don't know this author. I'm getting no compensation for about to be doing this, but this book. Wild Plants of North America Field Guide. And again, I'm going to include this. You don't have to write this down. But the reason I like this book as opposed to other books is on the inside of the pages, this is where I got the information for the packets I sent you guys. These quick little guides, these little images here, I know for sure, okay, this plant, it's got the symbol that tells me it's safe for trail nibble. It's just like quick references, not to mention Look at all these awesome colored photos. But having more than one book is important because this other book that I have goes way more into habitat. Like that's not as fun visually to read, but it goes into a lot more deal about growth habitat, where I'm gonna find it, um, just companion plants, things of that nature. But yes, I will gladly share that list with you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, trial and error stories <laughs> are, are, are good sharing opportunities. I won't go into too much detail, but similar to common chickweed, you will learn the hard way of what plants can be, you know, natural laxatives, like wood sorrel. <laughs> Don't go munching out like gummies. Oh, great. I'm glad. I'm so glad. So somebody asked about mayapple fruit. And so reality check of uploading videos on YouTube, by the way, our hike was longer. It was a 25 minute hike, but they made me cut out a bunch of stuff. One of the species, one of the bonus or honorable mentions I was going to include were mayapples. And so mayapple, they do produce fruit and the pulp or the actual meat of the fruit part is edible, but the seeds, the skin, the leaves, the root, everything else about the mayapple plant is toxic. So it's not one that I tend to introduce to new foragers because it does take a lot of um, attention to what you're foraging and, and, and cleaning out, making sure you're not mistakenly including a seed when you're getting out the fruit pulp. So it, they are edible, but thank you. You also said the seeds are poisonous. So it's just one of those reminders of well, one part of a plant might be totally safe and edible. That does not mean the other parts are. All right, well, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm very happy to see how many people signed up and still wanted to participate in this program, even though I had to cancel the in-person workshop aspect of it. I love plants. I love native plants. I love teaching people about wild plants and because I think it really does just make people realize how much we still need to depend on our natural resources. The reality is a lot of people are removed from our natural world these days. And if I can help bridge that gap and remind them that how much mother nature still gives us on a day-to-day -day basis, um, then I feel like I'm doing my job. And, and ultimately with wings, it's, it's about empowering and teaching women skills that we might not have all had otherwise. So again, I wanna thank you all for just taking, uh, let's say, hour and a half almost two hours of your day to teach yourself a new skill that will empower yourself and hopefully benefit the environment around you as well especially if you eat invasives 
All right, thank you so much. At this time, that is the end of my program. Um, I will be following up. We have your, your contact information from you registering. You all have, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna type in my, in the chat right now, my, per, my work email in case you all want to reach out to me after the fact today with plant questions or whatever, you're more than welcome to, but keep a look out for the email that's going to include this PowerPoint presentation, the list of the plants we did on our walk today, my resources list, as well as the link to the YouTube video for you guys to all access in the future. All right, I am going to stop the recording now. Thank you so much. Bye, Lori.